Fellas, I do send out the lesson uh, prior to the service, so if you are visiting tonight, uh, just notice the person to your left or to your right, they can just forward that lesson on to you via email, so it can be a little bit easier to follow along. Um, I don't know about you, but um, if you guys have been coming around in the church, and you're part of the church, having this long kind of break and this vacation and Easter has been great to rest. But for me, I'm just excited to get back on campus. Yeah. I know for me on Monday, I was just kind of like, my mind was just everywhere. My mind was just exploding. I was like, I don't know what to do with myself when I'm not in a Bible study almost. <laughs> right? And when that comes along, and even coming onto campus today, you know, there, there are a few students, but it's kind of hard to kind of get in there because there's not many. We can kind of make that excuses for ourselves. Mm. But um, I know for me, um, I really just came into this like, I really want to change it up. Right. Listen to the least in my life. Like, I, I want to start having this personal ministry where I am having people left and right, front and center. Mm. And I know around the world, people can have that kind of feeling mm. of, hey, we, we haven't seen the results that we wanted to, and how do we change it? You know, have you ever gotten to a point where you figured out what you've been doing so far has not been working? Mm. <laughs> you know, where, where it hasn't made you happy. You don't feel fulfilled, or you're simply not getting the results that you want. What are some common reactions when people actually get to that point in their life? Well, sometimes they continue to do what they're doing simply because it's easier than to change. Mm. It's more comfortable. Maybe they make small changes in their life that ultimately don't really change anything. Or they can be inspired to make a radical change in their life. See, no matter if you have come tonight with great faith that can move mountains, or you are discovering God or that faith in your heart, um, change is present in your life whether you recognize it or not. So when we start to understand that I am convinced I want a change in my life, have you ever thought to yourself, okay, now what do I do? I decided I want to change, what do I do from here? Well, whenever you get yourself asking that question, what do I do? There's no other answer than what would Jesus do? So my title tonight is How Jesus Did It. Mm. Point number one is gather yourself. Mm. What I actually discovered from looking at this, this, this lesson tonight is, especially when it comes into ministry, sometimes people can have it backwards. Where they realize, hey, I don't have as many people studying the Bible that I would like, so I got to go and just run off and invest in people. Right? But we're going to start to see Jesus did something quite different when he wanted to start his ministry. And again, point number one is we're going to see here, he gathered himself before he gathered others. Luke 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of Man, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Shall men... Uh, men shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in, in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, I, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The, the devil led him to Jerusalem. And Adam stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil had finished all his tempting. He left him until an opportune time. You know, this is before Jesus really starting his ministry. You know, he's out there in the Jordan with John the Baptist, and this is the time where he's going out to be tempted by the devil. But the very first thing he had to do before being successful in ministry, yes, even Jesus, he had to be tried and tested first. Even Jesus had to go through his testing before he went off into the ministry. Ever wonder what would have happened if Jesus didn't? spend 40 days in the wilderness? If he didn't sort himself out? 
if he didn't learn how to combat Satan now? I wonder what a, how, how that would have just changed his life if he never went through this. See, it is easier to face Satan in the wilderness than it is on the battlefield. See, Jesus had to be tested and tried before he goes out into the ministry. Before all that happened, he had to understand how to combat Satan. In the same way, I wonder how you would turn out if you are not successfully battling the test God has before you. If you're not looking at what you're going through and saying, hey, I'm going to fight this rather than, okay, I'll put that off to the burner. I need a Bible study. Oh, I'll put that off on the side. I, 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 need, a, I need a visitor for Friday. Mm-hmm. Right? No, the very first thing is you gotta, you got to face the battles God has put before you. You can't just go off and run off and try to fight another battle. Maybe because this present trial that you are praying to God release you from is a lesson that will, that, uh, excuse me, Maybe the present trial that God has put you in, and then you're praying that God releases you from it, is the same thing that God, that God will uh, draw you strength in the future. You know, this lesson or this, this trial that you're going through, it's the thing that you're going to have strength to, to fight the future battles when, when, when they come up in your life. See, the first thing you need to do is gather yourself and fight the battle before you. Don't just sit and wait, but start to learn how to fight. See, it can be so easy just to be tempted to run off, but we have to actually see what what is, why, why am I not actually being successful? Why am I not doing the things that I want to do? What in myself is stopping me? Sometimes we can always just look at the symptoms without really looking at the cause of these issues. But we got to sit down for a moment. Why, why don't I have as many Bible studies as I should have? Why don't I have these things? Let me look back into myself first and then I can go out and do these other things. Mm-hmm. See, how did Jesus fight back? Well, the, again, let's see how Jesus did it. You know, first it says here in his battle, he fought with the scriptures that he was willing to live out. Mm-hmm. See, when, um, excuse me, um, you know, he, he fought these scriptures, excuse me, he fought the battle with the scriptures that he was willing to live out. He didn't just have memory scriptures, right? He had these scriptures that when he said it, he was willing to live them out. In the same way, when, G, uh, when David told us how to win the battle of purity, he says that we need to write these scriptures on our hearts. So in Proverbs 19 verse 9, uh, 119 verse 9, how can a young man stay on the path of purity? By living according to the word. So many times people have these issues in their life and they say that the, the, the solution is memory scriptures. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says to have scriptures on your heart that you're willing to live by. That's what changes you. Sometimes people are like, well, hey, I'm losing this battle of purity. I I memorized five scriptures. Well, the the problem isn't your memory. The problem is you're not following it in your heart, right? So the challenge here is what Jesus did is if we want to start facing the, the battles that we're about to fight, it's not just facing them. It's like, do you have scriptures that you don't just memorize? But have scriptures that you know by heart because you're willing to live by them. That's how you're going to battle the fights that God has before you. See, Jesus didn't just say, man cannot live on bread alone. He didn't just say that. No, you see throughout his life, he was willing to depend on his relationship with God. He didn't just not bow down to Satan because God was the only one he worshipped. Uh, but but he, he, throughout his life, he didn't worship his family. He didn't worship the crowd. He didn't worship anybody. It wasn't just saying that he was unwilling to bow down to He wasn't willing to bow down to anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, it says that he never put Jesus to the test even on the cross. He didn't say, turn to God, God, you don't love me. He, he, he didn't lack trust there. He never put God to the test, whether that was Satan before him or the cross before him. Mm-hmm. See, if you want to change, if you want the change that you need, um, that you want in your life, you need to have scriptures that you are willing to live and die by. Mm-hmm. Scriptures that are going to be molded into your heart, where the world isn't a big enough temptation for you. Where, you know, you trust entirely on the sovereignty of God. Mm-hmm. Where even like Jesus, you're willing to deny food for these scriptures. See, To fight the battles that we first want in our life is that we have to have some scriptures that we're willing to live by. 
You know, David goes on in Psalms, in verse 11, it says, Your word I have treasured in my heart, that I may not sin against you. See, David understood that it wasn't just like the Pharisees or people that were to come, the religious, that just knew the laws of Moses. He says, I, I treasure these words in my heart. This is what keeps me from sinning, from doing the wrong that I know I should not do. See, knowing the words of the, of the scriptures will not change you. But you've got to put the scriptures on your heart. Don't just have memory scriptures, have motion scriptures. Mm. Meaning scriptures that you remember that put you in motion. You start to rattle it off and you're like, man, i got to do something. Whether that's, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, Matthew 28. Okay, go and make disciples of every nation. If, if that scripture's in your heart, it's not just memorized. You're like, wow, I see a Chinese person. We don't got a Chinese person in the church. <laughs> you know, couldn't you, whatever, whatever you say. Oh right? my God. <laughs> no. You, you, you get them to come in. Whatever that scripture is that puts you in motion. See, whenever, yeah, I know. Hey. Whenever you're, you're tested like Jesus here, yo, know, everyone's advice, any times that we're tested, right, what do people usually say? Stay close to God. Yeah. Right? That, that's what everyone says. Stay close to God. Have you ever been just tempted, though, when someone says that to you? Is I'm trying. Right? Just shout in their face. Right? Like, gosh, I am trying. I am praying, I am reading, I am doing a thousand other things that end with I-N-G. I, I am doing it all, right? But, you know, th th that's going to be the hardest thing that we're going to have to do, is when we're facing whatever battle that we have before us, is staying close to God throughout that whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, though God is the most consistent thing in my life, we can always find a way to misplace Him, to hide Him behind our fears, out of sight or lo uh, lose Him in our emotions. See, in all these things, though, is you can do all the great miracles. You can have all the, the people studying the Bible, all the visitors. But the hardest thing to do is to come back from a hard heart. See, staying close to God is the number one thing that we need to focus on. Because we understand that all the things that we want come from staying and having an awesome relationship with God. Let's not get distracted with numbers. We need to focus on, hey, if I'm connected to the vine, there will be fruit. Right? That, that, that's when we know that the result will come. So don't get focused on the other things. Get connected with God. See, the number one thing that would keep us away from God, though, is sin. We know here in James 1.15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. You know, we cannot be giving the living water to people when we are dying on the inside in our sin. See, the first thing that we need to do if we want to make a big impact here in New Zealand is we need to gather ourselves. We need to sort our ourselves in our relationship with God. See, we need to decide to sort ourselves out. Not to fall prey to the false doctrine that we've hit our limit of growth. That we've been a Christian for a long time, and who we are now is who we're always going to be. Don't fall prey to that false doctrine. Come on. That is not what the Bible says. That, 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 that there's nowhere to go. Instead, you need to be resolved to change. You need to get one scripture that you want to now describe your life. Yo, know, be tired of the sin that's in your life. Yeah. I know I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of hearing people saying, I, I find it hard to trust. I find it hard to give my heart. I'm tired of hearing that. You can give it. You can, you can decide to change. But you just got to not just memorize a scripture, but grab one and say, I'm going to live by this now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gosh, it's harder than I thought. Yeah, amen it is. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that describes a Christian life, amen? Yeah. Yeah. It's harder than we thought. <laughs> but but that, that, that's what makes it different when we say, hey, I know it's harder than I thought, but I'm still willing to follow Jesus mm -hmm. in this area of my life. Yeah. Point number one is we need to gather ourselves in our relationship with God. The one practical I have for you guys is go home tonight and find one scripture that you want to now describe you in your relationship with God. Just find one. It doesn't need to be big. It can be a first principle scripture. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Just find one thing that you can be like, hey, I want this to now describe my life. Mm -hmm. Point number two, gather the few. All right, Luke 5, 
verse 1 through 11. So after Jesus gathers himself, he's been through his own tempting and testing. Let's see what Jesus does. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gethsemane, the people were crowded around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were fish, uh, washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put a little out from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let the nets let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When he had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats on shore, left everything, and followed him. Yo, know, I really love this depiction of Jesus calling his first disciples. Don't you notice that he called them right after they had a complete failure? That was awesome. But maybe there were other boats that actually had people that, that successfully caught fish. Right? For me and you, we would have been like, they are not good fishermen. Let's go talk to these guys, right? <laughs> but, but Jesus, he called them all the same. That They failed in their job, and Jesus still called them after they, they failed. See, Jesus saw the best in them, and he was willing to call them to that vision. See, that's the first thing, the second thing that we need to do, is we need to gather the few. You know, so many times in, in the church... I know I preached this before, is that we can do uh, reverse resumes, right? Where in our jobs, we love to say all the good things that, that, that we are and all the great things that we've done, you know? Whenever we go to a job interview, we're like, we've done this, we're, we're an account manager, we're amazing. But once you come in the church, now it's like your, your reverse resume. Oh, I suck at this, I can't do this well, I feel like falling away every week, you know what? My ankle hurts, Pascal. <laughs> But whatever it is, right? See, sometimes we come into the church and we, we have this bad vision about ourselves. And we also get afraid when people see the best in us and call it out of us. You know, because we're not used to doing that with ourselves. Yeah. See, sometimes God will call you right when you prove to him that you are weak enough to use for his glory. That's exactly what he did here. He looked at these guys. These guys have just been humbled. I'm going to do something great and amazing in their life where they can see that I'm the one who's going to get glory from this. Amen. Y'all know that that's kind of how I felt this whole entire time that I've been called to lead in the church, actually. Since my beginnings, I was like, what are they doing? They have not seen my spiritual resume. You know? <laughs> um, I know for, before I, I was in Los Angeles and I just got baptized. And uh, it wasn't very much long after that that... My lead evangelist, he was just saying, he sat me down. He's like, hey, how do you feel about being an unpaid intern? And I'm like, man, that, what, that, that's cool. Intern, I don't know what that is, but, but what's, you know, um, what, what's this unpaid? <laughs> He's like, yeah, so what it is, you're, ju you're just going to be an intern, and we're not going to pay you. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so I, I become an unpaid intern. But I, I haven't, like, done anything, at least in my vision, to earn that, right? And so I'm an unpaid intern. I'm like, okay, um, all right. So nothing really happens. I lead a mission, uh, a, a Bible talk, where in about six months, we baptize two and two fall away. And then I'm like, okay, well, there is that year. And at the end of that year, um, they asked me, man, you're doing a great job. You need to go on a mission team. You need to come to Sydney. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, I come to Sydney. Um, I'm I'm not I'm a nobody. I'm not a Bible talk leader. I I, I set off the chairs and I'm mad about doing it. That's who I am when I come on a mission team. Um, and so I, I, I'm on the mission team, 
All right, um, I'm just doing my best. Don't baptize anybody, anybody else. You gotta be our intern. <laughs> okay, amen. Um, you know, I, I'm doing it, doing the best I can, leading up north. Um, I don't know really how much we grew or didn't grow. I guess is more how to describe it. But uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, we, we did get Tegan, my wife. Amen. <laughs> As before the meeting, but even after, <laughs> but even after that, you know, um, I feel like just the time, the year that I actually got appointed as an evangelist was a year that I think I think we still went negative in the North region, and you know, it, it was just this time and time again that God was just showing me I'm not going to earn my duties with Him. Wow. You know, I, I'm only just a servant to give him the most glory. Wow. And in the same way, you know, we can't fall privy to like, I have to earn myself, you know? Mm -hmm. You are just here to do the best thing you can for God. But sometimes we can kind of fall into this where we're only looking at other people in the bad that they do. I know just a couple weeks ago, maybe it was just even last week, I did a study of how to bring up sin with people. And it was more to teach us how to do that in a loving way. See, most times people in church, they come in here and they think your duty is to become a parole officer. Where you're just going around and checking people's sin and making sure they're doing okay. Instead of realizing what you've come here to be is a coach. Mm. See, gathering the few means that you are looking at each other around us and saying, how can I make Sephora the best? How can, how can I get in Tyrone's life and make him the best that he can be? See, Jesus was not ever going around. If you read throughout the Gospels, he didn't never just go around and calling out people's sin. The only time he did that with people that didn't recognize their own sin, right? The, to the Pharisees. Everybody else, what did he do? He called the best out of them. Yeah. Even the woman who was caught in sin, he didn't point it out to her. He said, I, I, I just want you to stop sinning. I want you to do the best you can. Even with her, he called her to the best. Do mm -hmm. so you remember, that's how I always felt in the ministry. I remember when Joe did go away for about a couple months when he went to oh the, the Philippines. And uh, again, I, I've told this, the mutiny, the this, the that. <laughs> By the time he came back, there was six followers. And I know I, I, was, I was scared having that conversation. But I remember th that conversation when Joe came back. He was just like, man, I, I, I love you and I know you're doing your best. Keep doing it. And for me, that I, I was just, I was just shocked because I thought I was going to get rebuked. What did you do wrong? What happened? Instead, he was just like, "Keep giving your heart." Yeah. And and that just showed me Joe's love for me that he just wanted me to do the best. See, are you that towards other people? Are you looking at other people, not just calling them to repent, but gathering the few around us and calling us to do our best? Second Peter one five through nine talks about what we can improve in people and what we can add to people. For this reason, make every effort to add your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. Mm. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, then you will, you will keep, uh, excuse me, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind. Forgetting what they have been cleansed, uh, been cleansed from, their past sins. See, if we truly want a productive ministry, it is when we are investing in each other. See, what Jesus calls us to do, right? Again, if you want to be fruitful, if you want the world to know we're disciples, what does he say? He doesn't say just go out and preach all the time. He says love each other. Sometimes we get confused of what that means. Sometimes we think we got to love people into the church. No, we got to love so much in the church they want to come in. Yeah. Wow. That's the difference. That's what he calls us to do. So the very second thing that we need to do is we need to start investing in each other. We need to start going around and say, how can I make Tyrone better? How can I make Ashley better? Mm. My second practical for tonight is write down by tonight or another time, Write down every name in the church and write next to their name uh, what the best of them looks like to you. A description of them that you want to help them come to. I want you to pray for them. I want you to invest in them. I want you to help them to see the good that you see in them. 
if we have that in our church, where we are making each other better, then we are able to make those who are growing here to be um, to 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 be away from unproductiveness or it says here being inefficient. If we are all going on for productivity and all growing, then everybody will be studying the Bible with somebody. Yeah. Right? It's not just about Sean go get a Bible study, this person. If we invest in everyone here and we all get greater better, then we'll all be able to study the Bible with others. Point number three and again, we know where this is heading, is gather the lost. After Jesus gathered himself, after he gathered the few around him, his brothers and sisters, and making them the best that they can be, we're going to see here Jesus now going out and gathering the lost. But how he does it is important. It says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Let me just say goodbye. Just like no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Mm -hmm. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Wow. We see here that Jesus got his men ready. It wasn't going to be this little fun field trip harvesting the field, you know. He, he, he told them, hey, the truth of this life, it's going to be like sheep among wolves. And he prepared them for the pains and trials of the ministry. And he did this by really showing them how to gather the lost. Now, Jesus does a lot of things, you know, throughout the, his ministry time. But one thing that he was not interested in being is a good salesman. You see, throughout him sharing his faith and preaching the gospel, he did not care about being a good salesman. He didn't care about making it nice and everything. He showed them what the cost was going to be if they wanted to follow him. You, know, you can tell by the way he called people to follow him. He, he didn't care if they were going to run off. See, when people fall away or don't want to follow God, that is on them. Everything was written in plain sight. He said, hey, I've given them everything they need to know. Mm -hmm. If they decide to leave, that's on them. But sometimes people will go and be scared when they're gathering the loss of scared to really call people to the standard. Why? Because they're scared that people are just going to run away. But Jesus already understood that if I call them to the standard or don't, people are going to leave anyways. Mm -hmm. I might as well give them a fighting chance yeah. that they know what's ahead of them. And you see this, that Jesus does this out of love, right? In Mark 10, 20 through 21, it says, Your teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Let's see how Jesus looks at him. He looks at him and loved him. Okay. But with this love in his heart, what does he say to him? One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Then you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow See, Jesus calling people to the standards was showing his true love for them. He loved them, and that is why he called them to the standard. Sometimes we think that we love them, so we hide the standards of Christ for them, and we're doing them a favor. We think, oh, okay, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to hold off this challenging bit so, so they can just feel a little bit better about themselves. See, Jesus, he saw him. And he was willing to put his relationship on the line when he said, hey, you still lack one thing. Yeah. One thing. Most of us would be like, are you serious? Jesus, one thing? Yeah. Jesus said, no, 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 there's, there's one thing. I possibly could have looked over this. You probably could have followed us and had the money in your heart and give to the church and everything. But I know that, that that's still an idol in your life. You lack one thing. Yeah. You need to go sell everything. Wow. And then you can come follow me. See, Jesus was not scared to calling people to the standards. 
See, Jesus would have felt the disappointment of him leaving him, too. He would have, he would have felt it, right? He loved this guy. Yeah. But when he called him to the standards, he was putting his, his, his relationships on the line. Wow. You know, it, it can be hard when you put a relationship on the line. I know that um, with uh, one of my best friends, actually, uh, when I first became a, an unpaid intern, uh, <laughs> this was my first year as a disciple, uh, back in Long Beach, California. Um, my first partnership in the gospel was a man named Clark. Um, and he was my first, like, partnership in the gospel. He was my first kind of guy who was the unpaid intern with me. And, uh, yeah, we're both unpaid interns. And, uh, so we, we were both just making all the mistakes, making, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, but it wasn't long after we both became kind of interns that, uh, he actually decided to leave because the standards of living in the ministry were too high. And that, that, that was like the first blow to my faith. That was like the first time that I really saw somebody I really loved and invested in walked away from God. Um, but he, he knew what the standards were, right? The, the, the whole time, there was no question of what the standards was or what to do, what was right, but he just didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But my good news that I also want to share was this past Sunday, Clark joined the kingdom again. Wow. Um, wow. Uh, Tegan didn't notice, but I was crying in the other room when I saw him join the kingdom. Wow. Uh, because he, he never forgot the standards. Yeah. He, he always knew where the kingdom really was. And he talked about it a little bit in his testimony that he, he ran off and tried to do it his own way and it didn't work. And he came back. Oh, wow. This is literally seven years after. Wow. You ever hear those stories where Joe says, you know, 20 years after? I never had one of those stories. This is my first time having one of those stories. I'm glad I have one of those stories now. Yeah. This is the first time that I saw somebody fall away and actually come back. Come on. And this just showed me that I can't be scared of calling people to the standards. Come on, bro. That I'm doing them a disservice when I don't call them to the standards. Don't be afraid of the standards of Christ, guys. Most of the blessings, even in our lives, or because God has called us to repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when I used to think that God made us repent for Him. <laughs> that, that, that was a major misconception. Like, He benefited from anything that I've changed. It was all me. That whole entire time that God has called us to righteousness, that was all us. God didn't benefit at all. It's not like He got, like, more angels in heaven the more that we re re <laughs> repented, right? He got nothing from it. It was all, the only thing that he got is to see the joy on our faces when we change. Mm. That was the joy that he received. See guys, people come into the church and they recognize the fruits of repentance, but don't ever like to admit where it comes from. They're like, wow, this church is so loving, it's so united, it's so great. And they don't want to just say it's because we call people to the standards. Mm. Right, because when they start to recognize that and accept that, then they know that they, they're below the standards. But it is out of love that we call people to it. It is out of love that we call people to repentance. So the last challenge, guys, I just want to encourage you with is be proud of the standards of, of Christ. Come on. You know, there is something about watching Ferrari walking down the yeah. aisle yeah. where we can all be proud of the standards of Christ. Mm -hmm. Where we knew that they had a pure relationship with yeah. We knew that this relationship wasn't just built off, oh, I like you and I like... No, it was built off Christ. Yeah. Having those standards in the... That's something to be proud of. It's yeah. something to be awesome about, uh, to, to feel good about. And amen, if somebody runs away because they don't want to live according to the standards, that's their fault. That, that's, that, that's their decision. But that shouldn't make you scared to call people to it, guys. When we go out and we're going to go and seek again... You know, we want to have more people in the ministry. We want to get more people studying the Bible and, and, and the visitors coming. Okay, yes, we're, we're going to get that. But it's not going to come before first we gather ourselves. Yeah. First we look at our own relationship with God and say, okay, mm -hmm. what, what do I need to improve? In come on. Where are the missing pieces in my relationship with God? Okay, before we do that, we got to first gather our few. The few, who's our few? It's us around us. Yeah. This is as few as this church is ever going to be. <laughs> if, we can't, if we can't sort it out now, yeah. We're, yeah. we're never going to learn how to do that later on, guys. Yeah. 
we got to look around us and really invest in each other. Not just say, oh, I want to better our relationship. No, not just our relationship. I want to better you. Wow. I, I want to learn how to make you better. Mm. And at the end, then we can gather the loss. Being proud of our relationship with God. Being proud of the people that we have around us. And being proud of the standards of Christ. And then we can have more people coming into the church. Thank you very much. Yeah.